Uh, so, uh, welcome to this, the Matt Forbeck um, and son interview meeting. Not a meeting because, well, this has already gone wrong. Uh, <laughs> is this like Sanford and Son or better? <laughs> this is not syndicated. Uh, <laughs> Yet. Give it time. <laughs> it will. It will. This is only going to be like 30 ish minutes. But uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself, Matt Forbeck. <laughs> well, uh, who are you, sir? And why are you interviewing me? Uh, I'm just a, a leaf on the wind. And nobody knows who I am. <laughs> uh, I am Marty Forbeck. I am a recent college graduate working for you mostly. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm hosting this. And what are you doing? What are you working on? Uh, I'm working on the giant dragon behind you. Uh, I'm working on the shotguns and sorcery role-playing game, which is right here. There we go. Pimp that baby. That's bad yeah. for our kids' education, our other kids' education. So yeah. Uh, that's something we're gonna have to talk about at some point. Is uh, I, probably. Uh, you know, current multimedia stuff you're working on. Uh, you're currently working on a role-playing game based on a book that you wrote. That's kind of it's, cheating, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah, but it's your own multimedia. It's it's and all under the, the Forbeck conglomerate. All right, well, let's back up and tell people who I am. Okay. Uh, for uh, people you know, who aren't my children, who might yeah. be you know less knowledgeable. Well, why don't uh, you tell people who you are? Okay, I'll, I'll do that. I'll cheat. Okay. Uh, my name is Matt Forbeck, uh, F-O-R-B-E-C-K. I'm a game designer and writer and novelist. I've been at this since I uh, graduated from college in 1989 and actually before that. And uh, so I guess that's over 30 years now, which is kind of crazy to think about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started out playing games when I was a kid. I went to Games Workshop after I graduated from college on a student work visa. I came back to be a freelancer and to meet my girlfriend who insisted I come back if I wanted to continue to be with her, who is now your mother uh, and the mother of my other four children. So that worked out pretty well for me. Uh, you've all heard that. You've heard that story before. Maybe I might have. Anyway. Um, and then I, uh, I, in 1996 or so, I started a company called Pinnacle Entertainment Group with Shane Hensley, and we published Deadlands and Brave New World and Great Rail Wars and a bunch of other games. And uh, after that, when I started having children, which were was you, we mm -hmm. decided to go back to Wisconsin, and uh, we, I started going back to freelancing. I did a lot of stuff for TSR which are the original publishers of Dungeons and Dragons and a number of other companies and uh, Games Workshop, whatever. And, and that was very fortunate. We moved back because three years after we did that, your mother became pregnant with your siblings, quadruplets, Pat, Nick, Ken, and Helen. And the entire community came out for us and helped us out. Uh, for a while there, after the quads were born, I took a job with Human Head Studios as the head of their adventure games division, where I developed a game called uh, Dracula's Revenge and Frankenstein's Children and the Red Hearse Academy of Magic, which was a D20 supplement. I've also done a lot of other freelancing since then. I left them to go back to freelancing as soon as your mother was back working at health insurance. Um, I uh, am probably best known for doing things like the Halo. I wrote three Halo novels. I wrote two editions of the Marvel Encyclopedia, which were on the New York Times bestseller list. I have uh, written all sorts of other games. Um, I've worked for video games, I've done toy design, I've written comic books, I've done screenplays, uh, a lot of multimedia stuff that crosses into different venues, which is the reason they asked me to join Sam for this uh, panel in the convention. Uh, my latest books include, or my latest work was the Minecraft Dungeons novel, The Rise of the Arch Illager, which was based on the video game, uh, Minecraft Dungeons, which is based on the original video game, Minecraft. And what else have I been working on? Uh, I have the Shotguns and Sorcery role-playing game, as you mentioned, which is part of this uh, thing behind me, you can see. And that is uh, a role-playing game based on a series of novels, based on a uh, number of short stories that I wrote over the years, which were originally based upon a concept I had for a D20 role-playing game, which was going to be, which was actually licensed to be published by Mongoose Publishing before your mother got pregnant with quadruplets, which kind of threw me off. Yeah. For apparently, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 years. Yeah. 
Yeah, I remember it was, it was originally a role-playing game idea, wasn't it? It was. It was originally uh, TSR way back, well, not TSR, Wizards of the Coast, uh, back in around eight, uh, two, year 2000, had a world hunt for uh, uh, the brand new world. You know, it was going to be sitting aside Dragonlance and Dark Sun and uh, the Forgotten Realms and all the other great stuff that they've done over the years. And so they said, let's have our fans pitch us world ideas. And they thought, oh, we'd get a couple, you know, a few dozen, a few hundred, whatever. They ended up getting 10,000 ideas sent in. <laughs> uh, and this was one of the ideas I sent in one. I'm like, yeah. And I had been freelancing for them. But I thought, okay, I'll just send in an idea. And it turned out my friend Keith Baker, who you know, and you've met yeah. many times. Yeah. Uh, Keith ended up winning it with a world city that became known as Eberron. Eberron, yeah, yeah. Yep. And then I ended up writing uh, a series of novels for that. I wrote three novels for that. Uh, about the same time that Keith was writing the original trilogy for it, I was writing a trilogy and we traded off novels like every other month for a while. Yeah. I thought I was going to have to throw in stuff to your to your bio from, from stuff you've forgotten, but you, you got a good memory. Uh, uh, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, I've been going through our garage recently, going through all the stuff that's been moving around lately as kids move off to college and your mother-in-law moved in the house and all this kind of stuff. Um, or your grandma, my mother-in-law. Um, and it's, you know, been refreshing to walk through it like, oh, look at this. Look what I found here. I found a laminated copy of the World of Greyhawk map and the uh, Marvel superheroes map that I had done at Gen Con many years ago. I found prototypes for games I hadn't seen in years, things like that. So it's uh, kind of a trip down memory lane when I do these kind of things. Yeah. So. So. <laughs> so. You, you got a lot of stuff to, to talk about. Um, multi I could ramble forever or you could guide me. I'm getting to it. <laughs> uh, However you want to pull it up, you know. <laughs> the only things that you didn't uh, list that I, I could think of in terms of like multimedia stuff you've worked on. You didn't talk about the video games you've worked on. Yeah, that's true. I've done a lot of video games over the years. Yeah. Uh, the first one I think I did that got published... I did the cutscenes for Armed Assault, the original Armed Assault, way back, Arm, Arm A, as they call it, yeah. by Atari way back in the day. Uh, I actually did that gig while I was working on a, a super secret gig for Ubisoft that I am not allowed to talk to under penalty of death. Uh, one of the things you learn as you're doing multimedia stuff is they force you, if you want to be involved, to sign this thing called non-disclosure agreement, which means that you're not allowed to tell anybody about what you're working on until it's publicly announced by the, co the corporation that you're working with. And sometimes those have uh, like two or three year time limits on it. Sometimes they're like, uh, it's like omerta, you know, this is for till death. You know, you have an agreement that you're not gonna be able to do any of this stuff. Um, and it gets tricky that way. You have to make sure that, you know, you don't bother, you don't get in the way of anybody's uh, PR department, right? Yeah. Uh, you may remember it a couple of times the PR department would say, what are you doing? I'm like, well, it's been announced over here. So I thought we, we are cool, but you know, yeah. um, you know, you always have to be as uh, as clear about that as you possibly can and uh, try to be as good about it as you can to make sure that you're not stepping on anybody's toes. Yeah, those are the only other things I could think of that you didn't mention were things but, that were either... Yeah, but I mean, for video games I've worked on, it includes like Ghost Recon Wildlands I wrote a huge chunk of. I was a story editor for uh, Assassin's Creed Origins. Uh, my latest work that I can talk about was I did a good chunk of Rage 2, um, and what was it? Oh, and Biomutant's been announced. I'm allowed to say I've worked on Biomutant now. I wrote a good chunk of that, which will be coming out either late this year or early next year, or whenever it happens. I'm not, a, I actually don't have any secret knowledge about that. So yeah. that's literally an NDA I cannot break for that yeah. part because I don't know. So, yeah. and I am working on a game at the moment that is uh, under an NDA that I'm not allowed to talk about, uh, both for tabletop and another one for uh, video games. And Hopefully sometime in the not too distant future, the rest of the world will get to know about this. Yeah. So let's back up uh, a little <laughs> bit. Uh, what was the first thing you worked on that was sort of like you weren't working? Most of the stuff you've done is tie-ins. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Of, especially when you talk about novels. I've written something over 30 novels, maybe 35 at this point. Most of them have been tie-in novels. Yeah. Uh, and for me, I had kind of an unusual career path that way in that uh, most people when they start out as novelists or tie-in no no novelists even, uh, they start out as a regular novelist. I mean, they write a book, they uh, then pitch it around to agents who then pitch it around to different uh, publishers and then they get published and then their agent says, hey, this 
group over here, they, they're they looking for, you know, Star Wars novelists. Are you interested in writing a Star Wars novel? And everybody goes, oh my God, yes. You know, uh, then they go off and do it. Um, I had started out as a tabletop game designer. So I was working for companies like TSR and, uh, and Games Workshop already. And then when TSR and Games Workshop ended up having their own novel departments, I said, geez, I would like to be a novelist too. Please hire me, hire me for that too. Um, unfortunately, the people in the novel department didn't care. They were like, oh, you wrote, you've written over a million words of published gaming material at this point. <laughs> That's not a big deal because it's like saying, well, you know how to sprint, but if you, and you say you could finish a marathon. Well, you know, sure. But th nobody believes you can do this until you actually do one of them. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I had a novel I had written in college that was uh, probably should be buried under six pounds of cement. Uh, and some radioactive waste to make sure that it never sees the light of day. I've seen it. And it's buried. It's yeah. It's <laughs> yeah, you know. It's awful. Um, and but you know that's what your first novel usually is. It's usually trash, right? It's it's a learning experience, literally. So uh, what happened though is I I had this problem that I couldn't figure out how to break into novels because I was too busy writing role playing games and board games and card games and other stuff during the day. And I'm like, God, I'm, at the end of the day, I'm creatively tapped out. How the heck am I gonna go write my own novel after all that? And uh, I was openly whining about this in a bar at a convention once. And a guy named uh, Ed Pugh from Reaper Miniatures said, oh, that's your problem. Hey, Matt, I'll hire you to write a novel. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So Ed hired me to write a novel for a game called CAV, Combat Assault Vehicle, which was their kind of giant robot, giant battling robot game, right? Uh, Gundam or Battletech or whatever you want to call it. And uh, uh, he said, write, yeah, write me a 40,000 word novel, which is literally the minimum cutoff for a novel for most awards. Uh, that's how you generally define these things. Yeah. Um, and I'll pay you five cents a word, go. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I wrote an outline and sent it to him. He approved it. I wrote the novel. I sent it to him. He sent me a check. He overnighted me a check without even opening the email in which the novel was novel contained. Was it? Yeah. Because Ed was such Ed's such a gentleman. He's such an amazing guy, right? So big supporter of, of his friends and of writers and creatives. And honestly, uh, it was amazing that he did that for me, right? And uh, so then Ed, uh, then when the book came out, like three months later, I mean, it wasn't like they were sending it through traditional publishing channels. Ed just published it along with the rest of his games, right? So it went out to gaming companies and or, you know, distributors and then ended up in gaming store shelves but wasn't in uh, like Barnes and Noble or Borders or Walden's or anything like that. Uh, and this is all before Amazon existed. And, uh, but I took the copies and I waved them over to the guys at TSR and at Games Workshop. I said, look, God, it's here. And they said, great. Uh, and they literally started talking to me about contracts immediately right after that, right? And they're like, now that we know you can do this, let's talk. And they signed me on for writing novels. I ended up, uh, I think my first novel for Games Workshop was a Blood Bowl novel, which I ended up writing four novels for that and five comic books and a short story and some other stuff. And uh, then they, uh, TSR and then Wizards of the Coast, because it's about the time that Wizards bought them, they ended up hiring me on to create their first young adult series or chapter book series, middle grade series, the uh, Knights of the Silver Dragon. And I wrote three books in that series. And they also at the same time, about the same time, hired me on to write the Eberron novels, I think maybe six months to a year after that. So I ended up writing a whole bunch of novels very quickly. And of course, then uh, your mother uh, got pregnant with the quad. So I was trying to, you know, raise a bunch of kids at once. We had five children under the age of uh, uh, three and under at the time. And uh, and I was trying to write novels and I was trying to write, work for uh, Human Ed Studios at the time. So it was a little nuts, but obviously we got through it. And that was one of the reasons that when your mom started itching to go back to work, I said, uh, I looked, I said, oh, uh, well, you're probably not going to go back to work. It was like in a, uh, like a July. And I said, well, you're probably not going to go to back to work in August. Your mom was a school social worker at the time. Uh, and I thought, well, she's going to start in September one year or another. It won't be this year, but it'll be next year. I said, oh, we can pay for COBRA, which is your 18-month you know, extension of your health insurance benefits. We could pay for that for 18 months. Uh, and I gave notice like that next week. I was like, I walked into him and I said, I love you guys, but I really want to go back to writing novels and, and games for myself and other people. So. Uh, that's what I ended up doing. I've been doing it ever since. And that's, uh, you know, 16 years of just doing that since then. And, you know, 30 years total of doing all this. I've, I've literally never had a full-time job out of being a creative. Uh, and the only time I've worked for other people is when I worked for you know, Human Head for that 18, 20 months or whatever it was. 
and that six months work for a games workshop. Yeah. Uh, the, the Knights of the Silver Republic and the Everon books are, are the, the earliest things that I can remember you doing uh, in my lifetime. Well, they were done before you were able to read, although you're a pretty precocious reader. You, I think you were actually probably reading at age three when I was writing them. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, 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 I'm sure you weren't reading those. Have. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so, so there's never been a point in my life, and I'm 21 now, where you <laughs> haven't been doing some sort of multimedia tie-in stuff. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and uh, plus, uh, I've done lots of games like that too. I mean, I did the Monster Rancher collectible card game. I did Star Trek toys. I, did, I designed uh, the Star Trek role play utility belt for the two thousand nine movie. Um, you know, video games of all sorts, things like that. So yeah. So not every editor is as generous as Ed. Um, Definitely true. <laughs> yeah. Um, you want to talk a little bit about? You know, having done like a hundred of these different projects now, um, some of the different sort of editorial oversight things you've experienced? Yes, sure. Some of my editors have been awful, <laughs> but yeah. that, that's fortunately the rare occasion. Most of my editors have been fantastic. I think uh, one thing you always need to remember as a creative is that your editors are generally there to help you. They want to improve your work and make it better, make it more saleable at least, because they want people to buy it. If nobody buys it, and nobody buys your work, then you don't get any more work. Uh, you fade away and you become uh, somebody who got one novel as opposed yeah. to 30 or 40, right? Yeah. Um, so generally speaking, your editors are on your side. When, when you're working in tie-in novels or tie-in properties, you have not just your, your publisher editor to uh, satisfy, you have your, uh, you have your uh, approvals person from the people who actually own the original property, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, and you, speaking you of which, with... I mean, this is for S SAM, which is originally part of Comic-Con. Uh, one of the projects I did as a tie-in was doing 12 issues of the Magic the Gathering comic book for IDW, which then, you know, which obviously is based upon Magic the Gathering. So when I did that, I was working with Denton Tipton over at IDW. He was a fantastic editor. And I actually flew out to Seattle to, or Renton, Washington, with him to talk to the people at Wizards of the Coast and get the dope on the newest Magic the Gathering supplements were coming out and working out story outlines and defining the parameters of what I was allowed to do and what kind of characters I was allowed to use yeah. uh, and who I was allowed to borrow. They were pretty strict about it. They were basically like, you need to come up with your own Planeswalker. We will loan you one other Planeswalker for one issue of the 12-issue miniseries. Uh, other than that, that's all fenced off. But we are doing something in this world, so you're allowed to go use this setting, uh, but you have to come up with your own character for that. And you know that was a bit of a challenge um, because I, I came with my own hero, my own villain, a lot of the supporting cast uh, that were not people that anybody cared about really up until yeah. that point. But one of the neat things about it was that the, then they then put cards in each of the issues of the comic book that were bagged with the comic book. So people who were big fans of Magic the Gathering would buy the comic book and sometimes throw it away and take the card and say, look what I got for my game. Sometimes they'd buy three copies of the issues because you're allowed three copies of a card in your deck. And then they would throw away the, the comic book. Hopefully some of those people actually bought the comic book and read it, right? Um, and one of the neat things is that the character then ended up being a character in the card game. And now you can play Dak Faden in lots and lots of different uh, things. I think you can play him in the, in the video game now. You can play him in the card game. And of course you groaned when I explained what Dak Faden was as a, as a very bad joke. <laughs> it so, is a terrible joke. It is a joke because yeah. uh, it's Dak Fading. Yeah. Right. Because uh, it's a card deck and the, the planeswalkers fade from one world to the next as they go. So he was deck fading. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, it's a bad joke. One of the other things you do is you entertain yourself by including lots of in jokes yeah. that you that maybe nobody will ever get. Sometimes your editor will get and say, no, don't do that. <laughs> sometimes they'll sometimes they'll uh, they won't notice. Sometimes they will notice and say, I see nothing, you know, and let it fly, fly by so they have plausible deniability if it ever comes up. Yeah. Well, hey, just because it's a terrible joke doesn't mean it's a bad joke. Oh, yeah. I mean, some yeah. of the best jokes are awful jokes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so like, you you worked with, like, in terms of, like, strictness of control, you worked with, like, everything up from, like, the Magic of the Gathering people and, like, Lucasfilm Story Group, very, very right. particular, down to, like... Uh, People who are not so particular, like like <laughs> I, I I don't think the the Eberron novels were so 
Strict well, remember on novels were interesting because the game hadn't been published at that point. The, yeah. the background had not been published. They literally sent me a 12-page uh, uh, brief. And it said, this is what we know about Eberron so far. And then they said, we're developing this part of the world. So go write your stuff in this part of the world that we're not going to get to for a couple of years. Right. And that's actually a decent way to do it. Because what that means is that it gave me some amount of creative freedom to that's create nice. stuff that wouldn't be stepping on their toes that they were developing at the time. Right. Yeah. Um, it can be very difficult. Uh, it's actually a lot easier to write for a game that's already been published, right? Like when I'm writing the Halo novels, uh, a couple of them were based on Halo 3 ODST, which had been put out years ago and, you know, everybody knew what they were and blah, 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 which meant that, you know, I could basically take the characters and do whatever I wanted to with them, right? Yeah. Uh, Halo has actually got a really good group of people that work with their, uh, their licensees, uh, whether they're in, uh, you know, T-shirts or, or books or comics, or whatever, and help make sure the story all lines up and matches up, right? And they would do things like, uh, Jeremy Patton out there would uh, say things like, yeah, that didn't work there. You know, the, the, this planet isn't actually over there. Or this They have a different kind of a system or those kind of aliens wouldn't be found there. But here's an idea that you can use and you don't have to use it. If that works for you, use it. It's a free idea. If it doesn't work for you, Go ahead and come up with your own thing, and then we'll work, we'll work it out with you. I mean, they were fantastic fun to work with, right? Yeah. On the opposite spectrum of that, um, and I, I don't think it's any secret that Guild Wars was a struggle for me. When I, I was wrote this Guild Wars novel that literally bridged the gap between Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2 over a 250-year period, right? That's a big challenge. And they're like, pitch us an idea that does it. I'm like, oh. So uh, what I did is I stole from great literature. I stole from the Canterbury Tales right, which is a story that's basically, they want to have, they say, let's have an adventure story, but that tells 250 years of lore along the way. Like, well, that's a challenge. So, uh, and it tells it from the point of view of a number of different races within this setting. So what I did is had the characters who are all of all these different races going on an adventure, but as they stopped and camped and told and ran into different things, they would tell stories from the lore that would illuminate the things that they were going through, right? much in the way that the Canterbury Tales is a series of stories that are told on the way by a number of pilgrims on their way to Canterbury, right? Yeah, yeah. So there you go. If you're going to swipe, swipe from the best, right? Of course. Um, and, uh, but the problem was that the game still was two years out from being published, right? Yeah. So that meant that things that we were trying to write toward were changing constantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes you say it's, uh, I compared it not to shooting at a moving tar target, but shooting at an exploding target that was going in all directions in three dimensions at once, right? Mm. Uh, and eventually, I just couldn't keep up with it. So they ended up uh, bringing in Jeff Grubb, who's an old friend of mine, uh, who was the creator of the Marvel Superheroes game and lots of stuff. He worked for TSR back in the day. But I've known Jeff for many, many years. And uh, Jeff was working on their lore team. He was actually the head of their lore team, the people writing the background for the game at the time. And so he was brought in to revise it to make it fit the lore. And even he was having trouble with it, right? Like literally he would write something in the lore team. They would write something for the novel and it would change the next week. And, you know, a certain point we're like, well, the novel has to go to press. So this is as much as it's going to be. And that's as close as it's going to be. And we hope it works. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the reason the novel says by Matt Forbeck and Jeff Grubb on the cover, because Jeff had to go through and fill in gaps that I just couldn't even see how they were going to open up at that point. Yeah. So that was a much bigger challenge. I mean, they were wonderful people to work with. Jeff's a great guy. My editor, Ed Schlesinger, and I got along so well that he hired me to do the Halo novels later, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that was a funny story. I was actually sitting down, and I get all sorts of different industry emails, and one of them popped up and said, the people over at Simon & Schuster just landed the, uh, the novel rights for Halo, uh, and this will be edited by Ed Schlesinger. I'm like, oh, I know that guy. Yeah. So I, I, was, I wrote Ed and said, Ed, I don't know who you've hired on for this yet, but I freaking love Halo. You need to hire me for this. And he writes back to me and says, Matt, you will not believe this, but I was literally writing you an email as your email came in <laughs> asking if you wanted to write for this. I'm like, well, let's make this happen. So it's, it was a lot of fun. I worked on three novels with him on that. And who knows, maybe even more in the future. But I had a wonderful time with that. The Halo people and Ed were great people to work with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so, yeah, take a drink. Um, yes, sir. That's how you make a joke land. <laughs> with a with a drink. That's true. Yeah, you gotta <laughs> makes a nice convenient pause. Leave some time for it to breathe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you prefer one system over the other? Like, like in terms of like getting flown out to make sure that everything's very particular, or or just 
being given a lot of space to do whatever you want. I mean, yeah, you're working I don't mind on something traveling now. To see people, I like traveling, right? Yeah, um, I know, but you're you're working on something now where you you have infinite space to do what you want because you own it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, I prefer to own things, right? Um, yeah. Well, part of that's because uh, nobody else gets to tell me what to do. The neat thing about working on licensed stuff, though, is you end up with a much broader audience usually. I mean, more people are going to care about Star Wars than they're ever going to care about any of my stuff, to be honest with you. I mean, there's just, there's almost zero chance of me ever writing anything will ever come close to Star Wars, right? Or yeah. even a thousandth of Star Wars or a millionth of Star Wars. So, yeah. so when I write a Star Wars thing, I'm a fan too, and I, I get excited about that. I had actually sworn off doing tie-in novels at one point, right? I think it was... Uh, somewhere in the mid, uh, like 2013, 2014, something like that. I said, you know, I'm done with that. I'm going to go back to just writing my own stuff. I'm, I'm having a good time with this. And why would I want to bother with somebody else's stuff? And then Ed got the Halo novels. And I'm like, ooh, I love Halo. I'll write Halo novels. And then uh, uh, Jen Heddle over at Lucasfilm wrote me and said, would you be interested in writing the novelization for the junior novel of Rogue One? I'm like, oh, yeah, sign me up. You know, I've loved Star Wars since I was a kid. Uh you know, and then other things like I got a gig doing a Life is Strange in universe book. And to me, honestly, Life is Strange, I was like, I've never played it, but my kids seem to like it. And I told you and I told <laughs> Patrick, one of my yeah. other sons, and Pat's like, oh, my God, you have to. Pat's the biggest fan of Life is Strange in the world, as you know. Oh, my God, you have to do it. So I did it, mostly so I could do stuff with you guys that you would be happy about, right? And then Patrick ended up doing all the screenshots for that and got his first publication credit. And then we met the creators of the game at Comic-Con uh, the year the book came out. And they were actually signing the book he and I had worked on in the booth at, at Comic-Con. Yeah. yeah, that was uh, an amazing moment. That was, an, it was really amazing. Pat had gone, I didn't even know what was happening. Pat had gone to see their, their seminar at Comic-Con and then said, Dad, they're signing our book at the booth after that. I'm like, oh, cool. Uh, let's go by and say hi. So I went back and say, hey, you guys, you're signing the book I wrote. They're like, come back here and sign it with us. So I actually <laughs> have to sit down there next to the creators of the game and sign this book that was based on their world. And that was a real kick. You know, yeah. Patrick I was just beside himself. He was like just glowing about yeah. that. He was thrilled with it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and, yeah, it's neat things like that where you say, you know, I'm not looking for tie-in work, but at this stage of my career, it tends to come to me, right? It falls in my lap. And uh, sometimes I say no. Uh, I, I, but if I'm a fan of the property or if I just enjoy it, like Minecraft Dungeons, right? I know I've played Minecraft. You guys enjoy Minecraft much more than I ever did. Uh, but Minecraft Dungeons intrigued me. And I happen to know a couple of the guys working on the team there that were developing it. And I had been in Sweden earlier in that year at a convention called Nurshen, Nordskan as it's spelled, but Nurshen as it's pronounced, up in Skellefteå, up in northern Sweden. And, you know, I had dinner and drinks with a bunch of the Mojang people which ironically is pronounced Mojang in Swedish and Mojang when you say it in English. Yeah. Um, but I had dinner and drinks with them. I had a wonderful time. Some people were at Del Rey were like, uh, would you be interested in writing a Minecraft Dungeons? And I'm like, yeah, you know, it should be fun. So plus, you know, there's a nice paycheck and I get to feed my kids and send them to college that way. So there's nothing wrong with that either. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> uh... So I don't know. I haven't been keeping track of time. <laughs> I don't uh, know how long we've we going. It said 20 to 40 minutes. I'm it's, sure it's we can said, edit a bit. It said so. roughly half an hour. Um, you got any horror stories? Uh, oh, I got all horror. sorts of horror stories. But Oh, you mean not, you're not involving children or involving games? Sure. Yeah, sure. yeah. I always um, think about um, the Viva Pinata thing, but uh, I'm not sure if you're actually allowed to talk about that. That was never actually that. announced. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, are you actually that's... allowed to talk about that ever? Yeah. Well, you just did, didn't you? I worked yeah. on something for a toy company uh, with Viva Pinata for something that uh, never came out. And, uh, I did sign an NDA, but it's been 15, 20 years. I think probably I talked about it, but I can cut it. Players. But that's probably about as much as we want to say. I don't want to identify yeah. anybody. Yeah, so, okay. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, that's one of the things about working on, that was a toy, right? Yeah. Literally for a toy company and working on video games. Uh, one of the heartbreaking things, and not for me so much, but for the people working at these companies is that, a lot of times you sign an NDA, you work on something, it could be for months or even years, and then the plug gets pulled. And sometimes the plug gets pulled before it's even announced. So uh, as a creative person, this can be hurtful to your soul that you have spent so much time, money, energy, effort into this thing that you can then never talk about to anybody, right? You're not allowed to tell anybody you ever worked on it because you're not allowed to tell me it, it ever existed. Uh, and that, you know, probably about half the video, actually roughly half the video games I've worked on have never been announced, right? The check's all cleared, 
which you know, great for that. I, I appreciate it, but uh, you know, that's not the only reason you work on these things. You work on them for the fun, and so you can sh show your friends and say, "Look, isn't that cool? I worked on that, right? Mm -hmm. The glory, so to speak." But uh, it's not always there. And you know, sometimes I know people have worked in games for over a decade that never shipped a game that they can talk about. Yeah. Right? And that's heartbreaking for them and heartbreaking for their friends and families. And they're like, well, what do you actually do for a living? Well, you yeah. know, I, I get paid to do this. It, it's, uh, I, I work know, on things that don't exist. Uh, yeah, I, I'm still <laughs> in my basement at my parents' house. It's okay. You know? yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's it can't be hard that way. Um, most of the horror stories are under NDA that way. None of them, you know, I've had, I mostly get, uh, some people get stiffed by other, by publishers and what. I'm really good about getting paid. I'm, um, mm. I'm tenacious. I will show up at your booth at a convention and say, hey, time to pay me. <laughs> yeah. so, um, because if I've done the work and you, pub especially if you published it and you got money out of it, uh, then you should be paying me for that, right? Mm. And it, I, as I often tell people, and you've heard me say this many a time, as a freelancer, you have three jobs. You need to get the work, you need to do the work, and you need to get paid for the work. If you fail at any of those three things, you're out of business. And being a freelancer really is a business. It's not just, you know, fun and games. You know, the middle part is often fun and games, but you have to actually line up the work. And if you forget to line up the work, then you have periods of time you don't have any work. And if you forget to get paid for the work or fail at that part, then you, did a, you spent a lot of time and didn't get anything out of it. You know, uh, your landlord doesn't care, right? They're mm -hmm. not gonna take, you know, I got exposure. They're not gonna take that as, uh, as payment. As the saying is, people die from exposure, especially in Wisconsin. You know, it gets cold here. So. <laughs> That's a good joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. We could probably wrap it up. We no, yeah, that no, I was about to say. Uh, <laughs> so we've been going for about 45 minutes now. Uh, about 10 of those minutes were your bio, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, <laughs> do you want to plug this? Yeah, that that's Shock and Sorcery. You? It's based on some novels that I wrote. A role-playing game came out for it. It was they ran a Kickstarter for it many, many years ago. And then uh, don't come in here. <laughs> <laughs> you just pointed into the void. Sorry, I know nobody can see. There's yeah, <laughs> a wife and dog coming by me. Your mother's coming here. So, yeah. Uh, but that's the reason I have the facade behind me. Anyhow, uh, Shotguns and Sorcery is a tabletop role-playing game that uses the Cipher system by Monty Cook Games. Monty was actually one of my first editors in role-playing games back in 1991 or so. Uh, edited Western Hero, which I worked on. Monty's done a great job over the years, worked on third edition Dungeons and Dragons, developed the Cypher system. And then uh, we ended up, uh, when I decided to do this role-playing game, or the company decided to license it from me, Outland Entertainment, they licensed the Cypher system from Monty. We got Rob Schwab to write the rules. I worked on doing all the writing for the background. And it came out finally this year, actually, for the public. So it's all in the back there, exactly. So go buy the game. It's very exciting, a lot of fun. It's a tie-in based on a tie-in game based on novels, based on short stories that I actually all own and I'm doing my own tie-in stuff for. Plus, actually, for another tie-in thing, we are uh, as part of the Kickstarter, we're doing a comic book based on that. And I wrote the comic. Uh, I've seen all the artwork for it up through inks now. So we're waiting on colors and letters, and then we'll publish it. So, there yeah. you go. And if anybody wants to find this stuff, you go to forbeck.com, F-O-R-B-E-C-K.com. And you can find me on Twitter at M-F-O-R-B-E-C-K. And you can find me on Facebook. Just look for Forbeck. It's Facebook slash Forbeck. Uh, and that's where you can find me. Marty, where can they find you? Um, I have a Twitter. It's, <laughs> it's at Marty Forbeck. I, I don't know. I'm not on much social media. Uh, I'm also doing stuff for the Shotguns and Sorcery, uh, but it's... It's not out yet. You'll, you'll you can see tell it. people you'll about see it. It's later. been announced that you're working on it. It has. So. It has. It has. I'm working on um, uh, fulfilling some of the, the Kickstarter stuff from way back when. I'm doing uh, uh, writing an adventure and uh, monster manual and uh, some of the conversion stuff for uh, Pathfinder and 5th edition. So you may be able to see this book in versions other than Cypher. Uh, soon enough if you're not a fan of uh but we love the cypher system it's yeah we love the cypher system yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if you but we know that you're... other people play other games and we want to make it easy for them yes of course exactly uh, i don't know if i told you i have owen k uh casey uh what's loan's last name blanking on it stevens owen stevens 
uh, who's formerly a Paizo, is actually going to be editing that for us, your, your Pathfinder thing. So That's cool. I hired him on to do it. He does a great job. I'm, I'm yeah, sure it's fantastic. That. Not that your stuff was bad, but you know, you always get a polish. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Owen knows Pathfinder better than anybody I know. Well, yeah. except Eric Mono who, and Jason Bullman, the guys who actually designed it. So. Right, right. The thing. Yeah. <laughs> I know those guys too. But yeah. uh, but uh, but Owen knows the stuff solid. He'll do a good job. Yeah. Well, um, anything else? No, I think we say thank you people for bothering yeah. to watch this all the way to the end, assuming you didn't Yeah, thank, thanks to anyone who watched this all the way through. Uh Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Well, I love you, Tiger. Hopefully we'll see you soon here back at Casa Forbeck. Yeah, I love you too. I'll, I'll be I'm trapped up in my apartment for now. And hopefully I'll see you again in, sometime in the next three months. <laughs> Let's hope.